guidelines, which are on your handout. There's a staple handout, and they're right on there. Um, so you can learn more on his website, saferemr.com. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Joel Moskowitz. Uh, thank you, Kim. I'd like to thank uh, the University Health Services for inviting me to do this keynote presentation. I'd also like to thank the School of Public Health for co-sponsoring the event, and especially like to thank Kim for uh, coordinating uh, the event today. Um, so I don't forget, there's a uh, journalist, who, a, a digital journalist, uh, who's here uh, filming for CNBC. And uh, after the uh, Q&A session, you may want to talk to some of the activists who are in the audience, and, may, and maybe some non-activists as well to get their opinions. So if you want to stay after the Q&A, uh, Adam Isaac is the, is the person who's hiding behind that pole there uh, to talk to. Um, I got involved in this issue by accident in 2009 when uh, my center sponsored a visiting scientist from the National Cancer Center of South Korea uh, who worked with a team of uh, researchers uh, and with us on two meta-analyses, which are quantitative reviews of the literature. And one of the meta-analyses dealt with mobile phone use and tumor risk. And uh, when that was published, he had gone back to, to South Korea. So I was left with uh, having to field media requests from uh, journalists from virtually all over the world who were very concerned about the findings of our meta-analysis at the time. Um, and uh, since then, I've been following the literature very closely, studying the literature and um, writing about it and lecturing about it and, and trying to bring uh, reporters up to speed on how to cover this uh, complex uh, topic and uh, set of research, which has evolved considerably uh, since 2009. I first want to go over some basic inf information to give you an overview of what the issues are um, that we're dealing with. Uh, I'm going to focus on the radiation risk, uh, and I'm not going to talk about the benefits of cell phones because I think you're all quite aware of the benefits of cell phones and smartphones. In fact, I'd be surprised if there's anyone in the audience who doesn't have one currently. Um, I'm not going to fo focus on the, the social problems and political policy well, this is social problems, uh, which range from privacy and security issues to varieties of inappropriate use um, or problematic use, including uh, addictive behaviors, uh, which are increasing all the time. Uh, at the national level, we're increasingly uh, seeing a potential cybersecurity problem with regard to the infrastructure that the cell phone relies upon. And there's a lot of controversy around the cybersecurity issues and which technology out of China is safe to use and which is not. Beginning in 1984, uh, we have fairly inelegant uh, cell phone, which didn't actually work very well because they often didn't get receptivity due to very few cell towers <coughs> in the country. You see here on the left side, whoops, wrong button. Um, and uh, over time, the cell phone be has become more elegant. It also has evolved from a single function, which was basically operating as a cell phone, to include texting, uh, game playing, music playing, to uh, becoming an internet delivery device. And with each of these uh, increases in, in functions, uh, a numerous uh, social problems began to evolve around these different different uses. Um, on the far right, you see the latest version, which is a foldable cell phone. Probably very few of you have seen this. Uh, I think they're going to sell for somewhere between $2,000 and $2,600, depending upon who you get it from. This model over here on the left originally sold for $3,000, but that was $1,984. Uh, and in the uh, lower right, you see uh, one example of a cell, cell tower. There is a symbiotic relationship between cell phones and cell towers, at least currently. You can't have cell phone reception without these cell antennas. Uh, industry is trying to get away, I think, from using these cell antennas. By sh and because uh, although we have a love affair with the cell phone, uh, at best people are ambivalent about having these cell towers. 
especially in their neighborhood. Uh, so they've been experimenting with things like drones and hot air balloons, and there's even proposals to put up thousands of mini satellites to provide uh, access, uh, to provide the, the medium on which your, your cell phone can operate, your smartphone can operate. Uh, the Industry Association, CTIA, and I'll talk more about their rather nefarious role in all of this. Uh, this is the lobbyist group for the wireless or cellular industry in the U.S. Uh, they engage in a lot of lobbying. They coordinate the lobbying of the various uh, cell phone companies and manufacturers. Uh, the industry as a whole spends about $100 million a year lobbying the Congress. They also do lobbying at the state level and occasionally get involved in local level politics and lawsuits. Uh, so you can see the rapid growth in, in connections. Not all of these connections are to cell phones, however, because there are other devices that rely on cellular subscriptions, uh, such as tablets. Uh, let's get these buttons down. As you can see, this is a big, big business. Uh, it's also a huge business globally, not just in the US. Uh, there's roughly five billion subscriber connections worldwide. Uh, so this is an industry that's probably been unparalleled uh, in terms of any other industry in the, in the history of the world, in terms of its reach. Um, and uh, this is important too, 88 hours per year is what the estimate is from the industry in terms of our average voice use. So over a 10-year period, the, the typical person would get something like 880 hours of cumulative call time. And we'll get back to that later when we look at some of the epidemiology. Uh, Smartphones sort of became popularized by the iPhone in 2007, and you can see the rapid up, uptake in terms of use in the United States. Uh, so the current estimate, or at least the estimate as of 2017, is uh, 273 million smartphones in use in this country. This is also a CTIA slide. It's hard to find good um, prevalence data in terms of use of this, these devices. Uh, this is a survey the Pew Research Center did with uh, parents of teens, uh, and roughly 95% uh, of uh, teenagers in the U.S., 13 to 17 years of age, uh, have either have a cell phone or have access to a uh, smartphone, according to this survey. I was unable to find uh, reliable data on use among uh, children under the age of 13. Uh, but I suspect the uh, prevalence of ownership there or access to s smartphones is also very high. Uh, the industry, particularly CTIA, has been pushing parents to give their kids cell phones younger and younger. Uh, and there's a lot of pressure I hear from parents of young children uh, for providing them with access to a smartphone. Uh, concurrent with the uptake of cell phones, We've seen a de decline in the uh, in access to landline phones. In fact, at this point, oops, wrong button. Sorry about that. Um, majority of households in the U.S. as of uh, 2018 are wireless only. They do not have a landline phone, uh, and this has changed rapidly uh, since I've been following this issue in 2009. Uh, the uptake of uh, cell phones and the decline in landline phones. Uh, as a result then, uh, people have become totally dependent for telecommunications on their cell phone or smartphone. So how does a cell phone call work? Uh, I'll just go over this really quickly. Basically, uh, when you go to make a call, you've got this two-way radio. It's, it's actually a radio and a transmitter. So it's, it's kind of misleading to call it a two-way radio, but uh, they tend to refer to it as just a radio. It transmits a signal to the nearest cell tower. Each cell tower sort of has a geographic cell, so to speak, in which it can communicate with uh, cell phones in the, within that geographic region or cell. And then that cell tower communicates with a switching station. i get the right button this time. Um, which then uh, searches for who you're trying to call 
and it either connects uh, through uh, copper cable or fiber optics, or in some cases through a wireless connection through microwave radiation with, with the wireless access point. And then that access point then um, either communicates with a, directly through, through copper wires through a landline, or it can, if you're trying to call another cell phone, it will then send a signal, uh, send, send the signal to a cell tower within the cell of the receiver and so forth. Uh, interestingly, here on the on the left, in this little graphic, the radiation from your cell phone is going out usually in all directions. In this direction, though, it's it's being absorbed by your head. Uh, this little child is is absorbing it in his largely in his brain and neck area. Much of the radiation, a lot of the radiation is wasted. So there is an energy conservation issue with regard to all of this that has been not very well studied. Um, but there's a lot of wasted energy. And then uh, some of that radiation will reach the uh, tower and enable you to make the communication. Um, I'm going to use notes for this part of the presentation. So what we see here is, is the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, the spectrum displays all types of electromagnetic fields arrayed by the frequency or the length of the waves. On the far right are the highest frequency waves, which are considered ionizing radiation, for example, X-rays. Uh, this radiation has sufficient energy to knock electrons out of their orbits, causing an atom to become charged or ionized, which can directly cause chemical changes and DNA damage. Uh, it can also indirectly cause such damage. And in fact, the estimates are 30 to 50 percent of the damage is actually indirect. Uh, ionizing radiation is known to be cancer-causing or carcinogenic since the 1930s. On the far left are extremely low-frequency waves that oscillate up to 3,000 cycles per second, which is also known as Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, after uh, one of the original um, scientists. These waves can produce strong magnetic fields. Radio waves occur at the higher frequencies, and the highest frequency radio waves are called microwaves or millimeter waves. Cell phones and cordless phones are two-way radios that transmit microwaves. Uh, they will soon also be transmitting millimeter waves. Cell phones can emit up to two watts of power. In contrast, the microwave oven can emit a thousand watts, whereas the oven has sufficient power to significantly heat tissue Wire phone, wireless phones generally do not except when held next to the body. Cell towers, cell phones, and other wireless devices emit microwaves that are modulated or pulsed to encode voice and data. Also, the systems that power these devices emit low-frequency electromagnetic fields. With the upcoming fifth generation of cellular technology known as 5G, you may be seeing a lot of this in the, in the media currently, Cell phones and cell towers will employ lower frequency and higher frequency microwaves than in current use. Also, for the first time, this technology will employ millimeter waves, where, which are much higher in frequency than microwaves. Now, there are some issues with millimeter waves in terms of the technology. The millimeter waves can't travel very far, and they're blocked by structures and foliage. In fact, some of the frequencies are blocked by water vapor, fog, rain. Um, so the industry estimates that it will need 800,000 new cell antenna sites. And each of these sites may have cell antennas from various uh, cell phone providers. Uh, and each of these antennas may have micro arrays consisting of dozens or even perhaps hundreds of little antennas, uh, which will be needed in the near future in the, in the US roughly two and a half times uh, more antenna sites than in current use we will see uh, deployed in the next few years unless the wireless safety advocates and uh, their representatives in, in Congress or, or the judicial system puts a halt to this. Millimeter wave radiation is largely absorbed in the skin, the sweat glands, the peripheral nerves, the eyes, and the testes based upon the body of research that's been done on millimeter waves. In addition, this radiation may cause hypersensitivity, which I'll talk about more later, 
and biochemical alterations in the immune and circulatory systems, the heart, the liver, kidneys, and brain. Millimeter waves can also harm insects and promote the growth of drug-resistant pathogens. So it's gonna have some pretty widespread uh, environmental effects for our, the microenvironments around these cell antenna sites. Cell phones, cell towers, and other wireless devices are regulated by most governments. In 1996, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, adopted exposure guidelines that limit the intensity of exposure to radio frequency radiation. These guidelines were designed to prevent significant heating of tissue from short-term exposure to radio frequency radiation. Our government's safety guidelines were not designed to protect us from the effects of long-term exposure to low-intensity radio frequency radiation. Yet, the preponderance of the research published since 1996 finds adverse biologic and health effects from long-term exposure to low levels of modulated or pulsed radio frequency radiation, such as produced by um, cell phones, cordless phones, other wireless devices, Wi-Fi, in 2001, based upon the biologic and human epidemiologic research, low-frequency magnetic fields were classified as possibly carcinogenic by the International Agency for Research on Cancer of the World Health Organization. This agency is often called by its acronym IARC, I-A-R-C. In 2011, IARC classified radio frequency radiation as possibly carcinogenic to humans based upon studies of cell phone radiation and brain tumor risk in humans. Currently, we have considerably more evidence that would warrant a stronger classification. The crux of the health and safety problem we face today was stated by the FDA in 1999. The FCC regulations are, quote, based on protection from acute injury from thermal or heating effects of radio frequency radiation exposure and may not be protective against any non-thermal effects of chronic exposure, unquote. Yet since 1999, the preponderance of thousands of peer-reviewed studies have found biologic and health effects from chronic exposure to non-thermal levels of microwave radiation and low-frequency fields. To further complicate matters, a smartphone typically has five different types of microwave transmitters, including three different cellular technologies, and soon with 5G they will be adding another cellular technology along with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Some transmitters operate at multiple frequencies and some transmitters can operate simultaneously with others, exposing the user to a complex mixture of radiation. In the next few years, most new smart smartphones will emit several types of 5G radiation in addition to these, some of these earlier forms of cellular radiation. None of these types of radiation has been tested to ensure that long-term exposure is safe. To reduce the risk of harm, individuals should adopt the following behaviors. First, minimize your use of cell phones and cordless phones. Use a landline whenever possible. Second, distance is your friend. Keeping your phone 10 inches from your body as compared to a tenth of an inch results not in a hundredfold reduction, but a 10,000-fold reduction in exposure. So keep your phone away from your head and body. Store your phone in a purse or backpack and text or use a wired headset or speakerphone for calls. Third, cell phones are programmed to increase radiation when reception is poor. A new study published by the California Department of Public Health in preparation of the guidelines they released already found up to a 10,000-fold increase in exposure when reception was poor, that is, one or two display bars on your phone. Thus, use your phone only when the signal is strong. For example, do not use it in an elevator or in a vehicle as metal structures interfere with the signal. For additional tips, see uh, my electromagnetic radiation safety handout, which you received today, or the guidance published by the California Department of Public Health. So, uh, in addition to the vast increase in uh, use of cell phones in our country. We've seen a substantial increase over time in cell sites in the country, um, running from roughly 2,300 sites in 1987 to over 320,000 in 2017. Uh, huge growth over the last decade. 
Cell antennas can vary uh, greatly in terms of uh, their size and um, as you can see here, here's a macro cell. This can be anywhere from like 100 feet in this case and it's disguised as a pine tree, I think, some kind of evergreen tree, to a macro cell of 200 to 400 feet. Uh, fairly new on the horizon is these small cells which um, you can see more examples here, which can be mounted on light poles or utility poles. And um, the new generation of cell phones uh, or cellular technology is going to rely very heavily on these small cells because they're going to need so many uh, of, of these to support the fifth generation or 5G. Uh, in most of these sites, you'll probably see on the, somewhere on the pole a uh, warning sign that the FCC has approved that if you get any closer than, um, than where this sign is, uh, you will actually exceed the FCC exposure guidelines, uh, which in my opinion and the opinion of many scientists are completely inadequate anyway, and we'll talk more about that. So now let me just give you a real brief overview of what the uh, research looks, at, looks like. Uh, first focusing on the cancer risk. Uh, in this, over here you can see a glioma. This is a section of the brain. This is the glial tissue, glial cells, which are the supporting cells for the neurons in the brain. This is a meningioma, which is the outer covering of the brain. These are tumors we're looking at. Uh, much of the research has focused on animal models, particularly rats, uh, to a lesser extent mice and other species because they're a good analog uh, for humans uh, and you can actually do experimental studies on animal models which you cannot do really with humans. So as I mentioned, IARC in 2011, an expert working group consisting of 31 experts from around the world including members of the CDC and the National Cancer Institute, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and National Cancer Institute, uh, concluded at the end of a, of a meeting and a review of the literature that uh, radio frequency radiation is possibly carcinogenic to humans. Many scientists today feel that it's time for IR to re-review the literature given all the research that's been published since 2011 to upgrade this to at least probably carcinogenic to humans if not, if not actually carcinogenic to humans. Uh, there have been some major Epidemi human epidemiologic studies that have looked at uh, the brain, can brain cancer risk um, that have been published in recent years. The Interphone study was actually reviewed as part of the IARC review. Uh, Interphone found a, a, in its main body of the paper a 40% increase in brain tumor risk, glioma risk, brain cancer risk that is, with six, for a group 1,640 or more hours. Buried in an appendix where they controlled for one of the problems with the study, a participation bias, uh, the, the estimates actually grew to about an 80% increased risk. Uh, this got buried in a second appendix uh, with some text saying why you shouldn't even pay attention to this analysis. Um, subsequent analyses of the interphone data done by researchers have found, uh, test, making different assumptions about the data, found uh, that the, these conclusions are quite robust. Uh, furthermore, they found that the risks are much greater on the side of the head where people <coughs> predominantly use their cell phone. Uh, and that in, in some of the analysis, they found that the uh, people who use the phone for fewer than 1,640 hours also had a significantly increased risk of glioma. Uh, Leonard Hardell in, in Sweden this was a 13-nation study, by the way, the Interphone study. It was partially funded by the WHO, and, and much of the funding came from industry in uh, these 13 nations. Uh, and the, gr the group of researchers um, tended, well, the paper, the pooled paper, the pooled data, tended to downplay the findings, uh, shifting the focus to uh, brain tumor registry data, uh, which, uh, was really misguided because there were problems with the brain tumor registry that they were citing. Uh, Hardell has done a number of studies. He's actually the pioneer in this field. 
uh, and he did some reanalysis of a couple of the studies using similar assumptions in terms of the age groupings and the uh, cutoffs and found very similar findings from his data that pretty much corresponded with uh, what the Interphone study showed. This is a French study with four sites in France and they found a much higher risk estimate, roughly a threefold risk from fewer hours, cumulative hours of self call time. Now glioma fortunately is a fairly rare um, form of brain cancer in, in terms of uh, annual incidence. However, if you live to age 70, you're talking about a lifetime risk somewhere between 1 in 200, 1 in 250. So if we cut that risk, uh, essentially if we double the risk, it's, it's cutting that estimate then down to 100 to 125 people, uh, one person would be getting a glioma. Now, focusing on children a little, um, some of the modeling research has shown that the child's brain absorbs twice as much radiation as the adult brain. Uh, oops, sorry. This is the five-year-old child, and this is the absorption pattern compared to the adult. Uh, this, the radiation guidelines uh, for handset use in the U.S. or internationally don't take into account uh, differences in anatomy. There's one size fits all, regardless of whether you're a 250 pound male or a 25 pound child. Um, yet the, the skull of the uh, five year old child will absorb about 10 times as much radiation as the skull of the adult. Yes. Uh, there's one completed brain tumor risk study uh, with children, a case control study like the Interphone study. Uh, looked at 7 to 19 year old children from uh, four countries. Overall, they did not find a significant risk. It was elevated at 36 uh, percent. The risk estimates were higher in three of the four countries, but if for some reason in Norway they actually had a lower risk estimate as compared to the control group. Uh, interestingly, buried in this paper too was a finding where they actually had cell phone company records uh, on a subgroup of the children. Largely, in the, in the bulk of the paper, they relied on parental reports of the child's use. In that subgroup, they found that children with uh, 2.8 or more years of cell phone use had roughly a doubling of risk, and that was significant. And that gets ignored in the discussion in the abstract of the paper. Uh, there's just a lot of pressure on the scientists, I, I think in large part because of their funding source industry, at least in part, if not wholly, uh, to downplay any risks that they find and sort of divert attention to their own data when they do find risks. Uh, there is an, another study uh, called Moby Kids, which is actually the parallel study to uh, the Interphone study. And um, the data were collected in 2009 to 2014. We're still waiting for final results on that study. So that should shed greater light. It's a larger sample than cephalo on what the risks are to children in terms of brain tumor risk. This study uh, was originally called for in 1999 by the FDA. Uh, they, uh, they nominated to the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences that the National Toxicology Program, or NTP, studied in an experimental using study using animal models uh, the effects of long-term exposure to cell phone radiation um, what they ultimately concluded, um, which largely came from a group of independent experts, here again the government experts tended to downplay the findings when they first came out, um, but the expert group upgraded the findings, and so in the final report, uh, they were reporting clear evidence of tumors in the hearts of male rats. Uh, these tumors were malignant schwannomas, the schwann cells, uh, are also a site for tumor risk in, in humans, but in the humans, uh, the increased risk is in, is in the head. It's a, this called vestibular schwannoma. It's, it's a tumor on the main nerve from the ear to the brain. Um, the scientists, I don't believe, looked at the, um, these cells in, in, the, in the rats, and I listened to virtually all of the three-day peer review and I, th I think that question came up. So they don't have data on whether it affected uh, the, that nerve in the, in the, the rats. The study, so this is clear evidence. This is 
This is the highest standard that the NTP provides. This is not possibly, probably, this is evidence of uh, the heart trioma's. They also found uh, some evidence of tumors in the brains of male rats. This also corresponds to what we're seeing in humans, uh, malignant gliomas, which we looked at just previously. Uh, interestingly, and nobody's made too much of this, both of these types of cells, the Schwann cells and the glial cells, produce myelin, which is a fatty substance that occurs on the nerves uh, within our body. Uh, the Schwann cells are in the peripheral nervous system, glial cells in the central nervous system. Uh, so we have some strong coincidences between what we're seeing in the male rats and what we're seeing in humans. Uh, also, in talking to a biophysicist, he had a theory that myelinated nerves serve as antennas. And so this could be concentrating the radiation that comes from these devices in specific parts of the body. Uh, we'll come back to uh, myelination in a little bit when we talk about hypersensitivity. Uh, they also found some evidence of tumors in the adrenal glands of male rats. And for the um, mice and the female rats, they found some evidence, but they considered it equivocal because the patterns didn't match what they expected to see. Uh, they sort of downplayed the findings in terms of direct application, but not as much as the FDA did, trying to totally dismiss this $30 million study that we've been waiting for, that the FDA has been waiting for since 1999. Normally, this study should have taken maybe five to 10 years at very most, but uh, they ran into a number of obstacles, including funding, and then finding a contractor who could do the study. Uh, and then they sat on the data, I think, for a number of years before finally releasing it. Uh, other findings in the study, which are critical, uh, include DNA damage in the brains of the male and female mice and rats, increased degeneration in the hearts of the male and female rats, um, decreased birth weights in the rats exposed prenatally. And uh, this is a finding that you have to dig through the appendix to find, but I was looking for it because an early Air Force finding found, early Air Force study looking at microwave radiation exposure at much lower levels than used in this study. This was pre-cell phones. Uh, the military had a big interest in this because of the use of radar. Uh, and um, found a threefold increase in overall tumor risk in the animals exposed long term to microwave radiation. So digging through the appendices, uh, and I suggested to them in the final report, they actually uh, put this analysis in the main body of the paper, but they ignored my suggestion. You find that the highest overall cancer incidence was in the middle exposure groups, not the highest exposure group. And you can see fairly substantial differences there that were indeed statistically significant, uh, 42 to 46% in the two middle exposure groups compared to 27% in the control group. Uh, they also found for the lowest exposure groups, greater uh, non-malignant tumor incidence versus the sham control. Uh, nobody's paying much attention to these findings. And I think they're extremely critical. Uh, part of the criticism of the study uh, is that they used exposures, full body exposures that were much higher than you would typically get uh, from a cell phone. They're more comparable to the partial body exposures, so that the head or the body exposures you get from a cell phone. But this was a full body exposure. But interestingly, the Ramazzini Institute in Italy basically rep replicates the key NTP result uh, in terms of the heart schwannoma, and they used much lower exposures. In fact, they found that it uh, 0.1 watts per kilogram compared to exposures ranging from 1.5 to 6 watts per kilogram in the NTP study. Uh, this study has yet to receive a whole lot of attention in the media. It, actually, ni neither study got a whole lot of attention in the media, believe it or not. And the New York Times report on the, on the um, NTP study, uh, I think, totally missed the boat and, and was in the direction of problem minimization. And yet, reporters from the New York Times and other papers had interviewed me and other people, and then they just ignored what we had to say about the study. Um, there are other health risks. Um, in, that have been found in humans, the evidence generally is not as strong. Uh, I mentioned glioma, 
acoustic aroma or the Schwann cells on that nerve from the ear to the brain, meningioma, which is the outer covering of the brain, parotid gland, which is the largest um, salivary gland, pituitary gland, and most recently the thyroid gland, a study out of Yale University School of Medicine and the Connecticut Department of Public Health found, uh, found not quite significantly increased risk, but almost, it was marginally significant increased risk, particularly in the males of thyroid gland tumors. We're seeing an epidemic of thyroid gland tumors, which this may uh, be partially responsible for. And there is one case series of four women who received, who, uh, who had breast cancers, multifocal tumors, uh, in the location of the breasts where they stored their cell phone for significant periods of time. My, I, I've heard they, they've been accumulating, research has been accumulating other cases, uh, but there hasn't been much since that first report in the literature that I'm aware of. The strong, strongest evidence probably, even more so than the brain tumor risk, is for sperm damage in the males, uh, male infertility, and in females, miscarriage and preterm birth. Uh, there's lesser evidence, but there's definitely a body of research that's accumulating. Uh, with regard to children, there hasn't been a lot of studies. What they tend to find is from prenatal and early childhood exposures, increased headaches, hearing problems, impaired memory, and a recent study replicated a finding in adolescence uh, in terms of figural memory for kids who use the phone on their right ear. Uh, increased incidence of ADHD, and there's actually animal model studies suggesting this as well for the an animal analog of ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity. Uh, and there's a couple of papers by a researcher at Harvard, Martha Herbert, who uh, says that this may be at least a cofactor for autism, if not a direct cause. Uh, one of the phenomena with very low exposure to microwave radiation is um, increased um, penetration or opening of the blood-brain barrier, which can then allow chemical toxins into the brain that are in the circulatory system. Electrohypersensitivity, uh, there's a range of symptoms that people experience and attribute to their exposures e to either to uh, microwave radiation or power line frequencies, uh, and it includes headaches, fatigue, insomnia, uh, ringing of the ears or tinnitus, heart palpitations, uh, this is an interesting uh, table from a paper comparing the symptoms of electrohypersensitivity uh, to the symptoms of demyelination. The most common form of that is multiple sclerosis. There's quite a bit of overlap in the symptoms. Uh, here, too, we're talking about the myelin producing cells, uh, so there's reason to think that there may be a connection uh, between these uh, diseases. We can talk more about that in the Q&A session. Cell tower studies, there's been a roughly a dozen epidemiologic studies showing associations between proximity to a cell tower over a long period of time and various kinds of effects, mostly neurobehavioral, in some cases cancer incidence. All of these studies, because they're ecological observational studies and not experimental studies, have alternative explanations. It's hard to control for confounding. Uh, largely. Uh, there's an excellent review by uh, Blake Levin and Henry Lai. Uh, you have to rely on the, on the animal model studies, the experimental studies showing all kinds of adverse effects from oxidative stress due to low intensity exposures to uh, radio frequency fields, particularly microwaves. <coughs> the International EMF Scientist Appeal uh, calls for stronger regulation of electromagnetic fields and health warnings. It's been signed by 247 scientists who have all published peer-reviewed research on electromagnetic fields. Uh, I did a, a search in, a, in an archive EMF portal and I found 2,000 unduplicated count of, of papers that these scientists have published on electromagnetic fields and, and biology or health. Uh, these scientists come from 42 nations and they made some, a very strong statement, which I won't read now, uh, when you look at the slide, regarding the the effects that the literature documents that they feel calls for uh, warning the public and stronger um, regulations. So you'd think, given this large body of researchers, uh, we'd have no problem with getting governments to adopt stronger regulations and health warnings. Unfortunately, 
as with many other issues like tobacco or asbestos or various chemicals or global warming for that matter, there is a body of researchers who are basically uh, defending uh, the industry promoted guidelines that have been adopted by the FCC and by ICNRP, which is the international equivalent of the FCC, uh, which the WHO relies upon. And very recently, a team of investigative journalists identified 14 scientists, actually named them, uh, who defend these obsolete exposure guidelines. And they do so by preparing biased reviews of the literature for various health agencies around the world. Uh, at least eight of these individuals have had industry research funding. There may be another dozen EMF scientists around the world who are take a similar position as these uh, researchers. Uh, but mostly in the U.S., we're hearing from non-EMF researchers, people who have never published research, uh, typically physicists, engineers, sometimes oncologists, who are defending the FCC guidelines, saying the only risks are short-term and due to heating. Um, let's touch a little bit on policy. We can get into this more in the Q&A session. 1996, the Congress adopted the Telecommunications Act. It has a section that basically says that no state or local government entity may regulate the placement, construction, or modification of personal wireless service facilities, aka cell towers, on the basis of environmental effects of radio frequency emissions mm -hmm. to the extent that such emissions comply with FCC regulations. This causes a great deal of problems for communities that are trying to fight cell towers because the courts have interpreted environmental effects to be health effects. So you can't argue it on health grounds. You have to hire, basically argue it on aesthetic grounds if you don't want a cell tower in front of your home or in your backyard. Uh, we can talk about that some more later. The government, our government has really been disingenuous and irresponsible on this issue, like most governments in the world. They do have a huge conflict of interest in that they sell, this, they, they sell licenses for the spectrum. So one small piece of spectrum that they just sold, they, they netted in the auction $700 million, and they were disappointed because they thought they could get a billion dollars for it. Also, state and local governments collect, on average, 19% of your cell phone bill. And then, of course, there's all the jobs it creates and the money that comes in terms of, I assume some of these companies pay taxes, but you never know in this day and age. So the government has a huge conflict of interest here. Uh, both parties are complicit in protecting this industry and are heavily lobbied by this industry. They, on the one hand, they say we need more evidence, but then they don't fund the evidence or they delay the production of the one study they did fund. Uh, and uh, we've had some agencies, uh, cities of Boston and Philadelphia, who've submitted to the uh, FCC complaints that basically there's no leadership in the government, there's a complete pass the buck attitude. The FCC is, doesn't have any health expertise and has been irresponsible on this issue. Um, <coughs> Senator Blumenthal, way down at the bottom if you can see, whoops, sorry. Um, in a recent exchange in a Senate Commerce hearing uh, where industry officials presented, came to the, concluded the hearing saying, so there really is no research ongoing. We're kind of flying blind here as far as health and safety is concerned with regard to 5G. We can go beyond that and we could also say with regard to 1G, 2G, 3G, and 4G, we've been flying blind. Uh, a couple of years ago, I tried to find experts within our federal health agencies. I found, a, I found basically one person, he's retired now. Um, the, the person I interviewed at the FDA who's supposedly the most knowledgeable and, suppo and supposed to be advising the FCC was a complete denialist with regard to uh, long-term risks. Uh, he was the head of a unit that was responsible for this uh, topic. Uh, it turned out later when I searched him on LinkedIn, he was a nuclear engineer. Um, he's since moved on, and I suspect his successor isn't any more knowledgeable. And uh, the interview lasted like two hours, and essentially we got down to the point where we were debating studies, and it showed to me that he clearly didn't understand how medical or biologic research worked or epidemiologic research worked uh, and was just looking to dismiss studies. Uh, and that's how he was able to maintain his sanity, I guess, by um, just ignoring the whole issue. There's an interesting monograph looking into the FCC and how it's been captured by industry. Uh, the link is down here on, on my website to the monograph. Uh, this was a career journalist. 
And this has gone on even before the cellular problem with regard to earlier, it was the broadcast industry controlled the FCC. It's a perfect institute of regulatory capture. These other agencies are supposed to be involved in a work group. The work group turned out to be a sham when I investigated it. It has no official functions. They would meet over a phone one, one hour uh, three times a year. The, le the, prior, the prior session was uh, five people. Um, there's been a variety of actions at the local level, at the federal level, trying to get, including the GAO here. There's, all this information is on my saferemr.com website in greater detail. Uh, the GAO, most recently, Montgomery County, Maryland is suing the FCC over the exposure guidelines, or wants to sue. They petitioned the court to allow the suit. We'll see if it happens. It's in the Ninth Circuit. A number of organizations have also called for uh, changes in the FCC's RF limits or testing. The FCC opens up these uh, requests for public input. They did one in 2003, another in 2013, and then they never do anything with the filings. The most recent filing has over a thousand submissions, many thousands of documents, studies submitted, and they just ignore it. Um, maybe I should stop since time is up. I can finish this perhaps in the beginning of the Q&A session. Thank you. I also have a lot of supplemental slides, which I won't um, go through, but will be part of the um, online version of this. Um, I actually spent three and a half hours on the phone just going over the basic issues with one reporter for a major paper. So it's hard to condense this down. Um, and then no reports resulted as a result of it because the work was suppressed by her editor. And this wasn't the first time she tried to publish stuff. Um, if you look at our, if you go online and look at our federal health agency websites, you will see uh, health warning information, but it's usually not, it's usually framed, we're not recommending this, but if you're worried, uh, here's some things you can do. CDC actually for a 10 week period a few years ago said we recommend you take precautions and then once the industry funded scientists saw it, it got pulled down. Uh, that eventually got written up in, in the New York Times a few years ago, uh, that story. And the back story is on a website called Microwave News, which I have a link to later. So regarding to the scientific evidence, they use carefully worded language saying there's no consistent evidence uh, it does not show a danger. There's no scientific evidence that establishes a causal link uh, where there's no adverse health effects established as being caused by. Um, but as, as I was saying earlier, I, I would think the vast majority of people who have actually done research on the biologic and health effects believe there are indeed serious uh, risks of harm, uh, but the governments don't want to listen to them. Uh, the industry, the CTIA, has a statement where they basically hide behind the FCC, the FDA, the WHO, the Cancer Society, and say that the science, and they make the claim the scientific evidence shows no known health risks due to the RF energy emitted by cell phones. This is this only a year ago. Um, and in a recent uh, conference call with a legislative assistant to, to a member of Congress, uh, he was asked, what, you hear from, you're the telecom person, you hear from the industry all the time, what do they say about health? And he says, they don't say anything. Mm -hmm. And they have gotten in trouble in the past when they made these statements. Uh, I think one guy got fired, one of their major PR guys, for saying um, the wrong thing. Um, if you want to get into the politics and policy as well as the research, an excellent website goes back 35 years is uh, Lewis Lessons Microwave News. Um, you can download all these early documents and trace the history of how we got into this predicament. Uh, more recent uh, study done by uh, two investigative journalists that's been published in The Nation and The Guardian and a few other places uh, is a report by Mark Hertzgard and Mark Dowie on how big wireless made us think that cell phones are safe. Uh, and then there's this investigated Europe, Europe series. Some of the papers are still to be published. Uh, they're in other languages, but you can use Google Translate and see how this is operating 
uh, on the international level how these scientists basically um, downplay the risks of the research that many of them are gathering themselves that show evidence of risk. A couple case studies, San Francisco in 2010 unanimously adopted a cell phone right to know law. The first version had discussed some health risks, they immediately got sued by the CTIA. Uh, they revised the fact sheet to take out the health risks uh, to make it fairly innocuous, but still they thought useful. Uh, the appeals court overturned it because on, more on procedural grounds that it was too burdensome that they had to post things and hand out things and so forth. Uh, the supervisors could have made some further modifications, but at that point, Gavin Newsom, who was the mayor of San Francisco, moved on to become lieutenant governor, and he was the primary supporter of this ordinance uh, at the time. Uh, and so the supervisors, when they were threatened by the industry of having to pay the industry's legal bills, which were quite substantial, I'm sure, uh, decided just to stand with the law and stop fighting the industry after a three-year three period. Uh, Governor, now Governor Newsom uh, reported in a uh, film called Mobilize uh, that he'd never seen such blowback from an industry before, wow. and he probably will never see since. Uh, and so he's reluctant to do anything publicly on this, on this issue. Uh, I've heard from activists who've talked to his staff that he still tells them to take precaution with their cell phones, which is nice. Um, city of Berkeley, had a, was going to adopt back in 2010, but decided as soon as uh, CTIA sued San Francisco, they'd see, wait until see what the dust, wait until the dust settled. And uh, in 2015, they decided that they would adopt the law. Um, that too was unanimously adopted. CTI once again immediately filed the lawsuit, uh, and uh, the city made a minor revision to the to the ordinance notification, which was a seven-word sentence that said children may absorb more radiation than adults, which the science supports, but the FCC doesn't recognize, so the courts wouldn't recognize it. So they modified it, took that out. Uh, the district judge said, fine, you can go forward, lifted, uh, let, let them implement the law. So the law has been in effect, um, but it's still being appealed at various levels, including the Ninth Circuit, by the industry. They bumped it up to the Supreme Court because they didn't like what the Ninth Circuit ruling was. Ninth, uh, the Supreme Court decided not to take the case, sent it back to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, it's under review by the Ninth Circuit uh, panel once again, and we'll see what happens. Uh, the lead lawyer, and this is a fellow named Lawrence Lessig, who's a Harvard Law professor, he drafted the ordinance with the dean of the Yale Law School, and it was it's a very modest notification, as you can see here, which appears in the cell phone stores in Berkeley, or at least should appear in the cell phone stores in Berkeley. I think most of that have it. Um, doesn't talk about health risks at all. It just talks about the FCC's exposure guidelines and the fact that you will exceed them if you hold the phone uh, next to your body. And um, the FCC is very explicit on this and wants the manufacturers to tell people about this but the manufacturers typically bury this information in the manuals or in the smartphone itself because uh, they don't really don't want people to pay attention to these guidelines that the FCC requires them to uh, give it to the consumer. So we'll see how that comes out. California Department of Health, I got a tip from an activist uh, that they had drafted cell phone safety guidance in 2009. Um, I learned about it in late 2013, submitted three public records requests. 2014, uh, they were all denied. Um, the UC Berkeley Environmental Law Clinic in the First Amendment project offered to take to sue the state on my behalf. I was the plaintiff in this suit uh, for the release of these draft documents. Uh, the Sacramento Superior Court, uh, after a court <coughs> hearing and a review of the documents, decided that there was no reason for them to withhold these draft documents, um, that they were no longer drafts since they've been sitting on them for so long and they kept them and they kept updating them with the latest research. Uh, so they ordered the uh, California Department of Public Health to release the draft documents. They also ordered them to pay for my attorney's legal fees. They had taken the case pro bono, so that was an unexpected win for them. 
they also, the department also had to pay for the attorney general's office legal fees, is my understanding. So this could have cost them several hundred thousand dollars, and they lost the case. Uh, interestingly, at the end of 2017, they decided to publish the guidance document after all, which made me wonder why did they bother to fight the law, you know, fight the lawsuit? Why didn't they just turn over the draft documents? This got widespread media attention. The, the links to the media coverage uh, is on my website, as well as the chronology of the events. Uh, it's in your handout, the document. Uh, there's a bunch of links on my website that go into various issues about 5G uh, and millimeter waves. And they're not one and the same because 5G is low band, mid band, as well as high band. There's also some good links on the Physicians for Safe Technology and the Environmental Health Trust websites about 5G. Uh, there's been appeal for a moratorium on 5G it was submitted to the European Union because they seem to pay more attention to people's health than our country does. Um, it's been denied by the European Commission. Uh, there's also an international group of doctors. Uh, the, the, group, the US group is Physicians for Social Responsibility that's signed on to the appeal calling for a moratorium on 5G until we fully understand the, the health risks and can assure the public that it's safe. Uh, there's a lot of emerging technologies. 5G is largely going to be useful for these emerging technologies, not existing technologies. It's not going to make your smartphone all that much more useful. Uh, it's going to be used for the so-called Internet of Things and all kinds of smart appliances, TVs, thermostats, etc. There's a whole thing about making cities smarter, having autonomous motor vehicles that can communicate to each other via cell phones. Uh, that the industry argues will need 5G. The 5G offers much faster uh, communications and shorter uh, latencies between communications. Uh, and then there's a whole host of wireless, wearable wireless devices and other wireless device, devices appearing on the market every day. Uh, some of those will probably take advantage, try to take advantage of 5G. Uh, here's a novel idea, which seems like a no-brainer. Uh, researcher at University of Colorado, Tim Sheckley, uh, who's promoting reinventing wires and talks about all the advantages of wiring, and that certainly solves the problem of, of uh, fixed or stationary uses. Uh, we can bring fiber to the premises, and you'll have a lot better uh, communications and much much more secure, use less energy, and so forth and so on. More privacy; it'll improve our health. Uh, that would solve the this the fixed uses of, of uh, access to the internet and communications. Um, here's a brief statement I put in my post about the NTP study. Uh, some news media picked up on variations of this. Um, basically all I'm saying is we have no assurance that 5G is safe, for that matter, that 4G is safe. I've only found three studies on 4G. They came out of China, and they all indicated changes in brain function. Um, with with uh, modest exposures, I think there were 30-minute exposures. We're way behind the curve in terms of the health, um, health research, uh, and governments like it that way, I think, as well as the industry. They don't want to fund the research. But in the interim, we need a moratorium on new technologies that involve wireless. So let me go to some of the um, questions. There's a lot of questions here. I'll try to answer at least a few of them, and I will post on my website uh, answers to others. Um, if you want to get them, um, I have an email list, general email list, uh, for people interested in EMF. So give me your uh, name and an email address. I can add you to that list. Uh, conflict of interest, TV, radio, major advertising dollars, newspaper, magazine. It's hard to establish what's going on. That may be a factor with regard to some of our major mainstream media uh, that they're concerned about losing advertising dollars. Uh, it's probably true. Uh, also, when they report on this, they tend, because of the notions of journalistic balance, there's this, they tend to introduce uh, doctors to provoke, provide the opposing point of view who know virtually nothing about the subject or physicists and uh, create a false equivalence then between people who've been studying this 
in many cases for decades, in my case it's only a decade, uh, with people who just basically based on their training in physics or medical school believe that only ionizing radiation or is dangerous or thermal risks for non-ionizing radiation. Uh, question regarding uh, cell phones in cars, what do you recommend? Try to avoid doing it, I guess. I have a, interestingly, I have a post on electromagnetic fields in hybrid and electric cars, which also applies to virtually all modern cars now, which is one of the most popular posts on my website, and it receives no media attention anywhere in the world, I think, this issue. The exposures in these cars can be quite substantial in terms of the magnetic fields as well as the uh, wireless radiation. Uh, there is an institute in Europe, I think it's called SINTEF, S-I-N-T-E-F is the agency, that has set guidelines, but I don't think any of the industry pays attention to these guidelines. for Because there are ways to shield this stuff. Uh, How about GPS? GPS is a receive-only system. However, in a smartphone, often that information is then relayed to various apps. So then the GPS system itself is not exposing you, but then the apps that use the GPS information is exposing you to signals that are being sent back to the app makers. Mm -hmm. So um, if you had a purely GPS device, you may not be at risk, but if you have GPS in a smartphone, you probably are at some risk of increased exposure. What is the rate of hyper-electrosensitivity in Taiwan? Well, there's an interesting, there's two studies. One, the original study found is based on self-reported population-based survey, 13% prevalence. More recent study found 5% prevalence. Neither of the studies gave a great deal of detail about uh, the methodology or the response rates. Uh, and self-reported electrohypersensitivity can be very problematic. It can be largely a function of how much media awareness or attention has been paid to the issue uh, prior to the survey. Uh, some people may be misattributing their symptoms. I believe they have real symptoms. They may be misattributing to their electromagnetic field exposures. But on the, on the other hand, there are probably some people experiencing symptoms that don't realize it's, it's related to their uh, electromagnetic exposures. Uh, status of 5G rollout in the city of Berkeley. Well, there's some people working on that in this audience, so you probably should seek them out after uh, this meeting. And there may be someone here from uh, the mayor's office and the city council. I think they registered. Each registered as staff person. What is the status of 5G rollout in the city of Berkeley? There's some discussion about um, creating emergency legislation. The Bay Area, by the way, is probably the, the hottest spot in the country for activism around the rollout of these small cell antennas in preparation for 5G. In the interim, they're using, they're putting out 4G radiation or LTE. Uh, in the past year, I've heard from over probably somewhere between 100 and 200 activists from all over the country, places like Montana and Colorado, as well as the East Coast and Southern California. And the traffic on my website, since I posted stuff on 5G and millimeter waves, has doubled since last August. So there's tremendous interest and concern about the deployment of this latest technology. Uh, it's should have, it should have been generated among for these earlier technologies, but uh, I think what's, what's driving people is the proliferation of these small cell antennas in their neighborhoods or right out in front of their, their house, pumping radiation into the, their kid's bedroom or their bedroom. Uh, people, while people have a love affair with the cell phone, at best they are highly ambivalent about cell towers unless they're really technological uh, nerds who, who think this is great having cell towers everywhere because you always have connectivity. Um, and yet there's this symbi symbiotic relationship between the two. You can't have good cell phone reception without cell towers unless we go to satellites, and that might be even worse. There's one proposal uh, to put up, like, they wanted permission from the FCC to put up 20,000 mini satellites. I think this was SpaceX, and a million uh, ground stations to create a network that wouldn't use uh, cell towers or small cell antennas. Uh, it sounds like completely unfeasible, but... I, perhaps, perhaps they should, the owner of SpaceX should go back to manufacturing a more reliable electric automobile. I won't mention his name. Um, <laughs> please elaborate to micro destruct. Um, yeah, I don't want to do that. I'll try to take the easier ones. 
Bluetooth hearing aids. I have a post on the, I, what's the one with the, the ear, wireless earbuds that iPhone makes? The i, AirPods. huh? The ear, AirPods. the AirPod, that's it. And in that I go into, uh, I talk about, I summarize the research on uh, blood brain barrier research. There's about a dozen studies that show it opens the blood brain barrier. But there's also another form of um, electromagnetic fields called near field magnetic induction that the AirPods uses. And I'm not, I think some of the hearing aids I've read also uses this. And I haven't found any health effects research on near field magnetic induction. But the Bluetooth alone could potentially open the blood brain barrier, allowing uh, toxins in the circulatory system to penetrate brain, brain tissue. Uh, so if you can get a dumb model of a, of a hearing aid, you're probably better off than the smarter ones. So evolved discussion. Electrotherapies. And that's an interesting question. Uh, TENS, I forget what it stands for. But there, there's all these electrotherapies. So on the, uh, on the other hand, the, the FDA doesn't want to recognize that Expo these exposures can be harmful in terms of consumer devices, but they've been approving of uh, various kinds of um, medical devices that use electromagnetic fields. And they're usually very uh, short exposures, pulse. Uh, TENS is, I think, something you, it's, uh, I forget what it stands for, but it's a thing you put on your back or someplace and it sends pulses and stimulates the nervous system. I haven't seen any studies on it. The FDA seems to reckon, recognize that these things can have therapeutic uses. And outside the US, there's a considerable amount of research going on showing uh, positive effects from various kinds of short-term exposures that are very uh, specific frequencies and so forth. Uh, EMF Portal is a good website. They were actually covering both sides of the issue until about a year ago when the German government said, we don't want to hear any more about the risks of microwave radiation and defunded that part of the website. So now they're, they're trying to raise money from uh, foundations and just ordinary people to continue the archive. The archive has like 20,000 papers in it, but they, don't have, they claim they don't have the funding now to continue to put into the archive studies showing risks from microwave radiation because of the German government's position on this. They are based in Germany, uh, the EMF portal, as is ICNER, uh, that organization that the uh, journalist claimed has created a cartel supporting the existing exposure guidelines. Um, a lot of these questions, there aren't really great answers, and so I won't speculate. Um, can the classrooms and dorms be hardwired? Yeah, sure. So people aren't exposed to the MR all day long. Of course. I mean, my, my office. It's hardwired, and yet they put Wi-Fi routers in. So I've got a router over my desk now. I hardly ever go in as a result. Um, hardwire it, rewire it. Uh, it's a lot faster, and you can go through Sheckley's slide and see <coughs> why it's a whole lot better. A lot of the, why, why was this industry allowed to even start if hardwired fiber optics is faster, safer, and more energy efficient has none of the health effects? Excellent question. It's all marketing. It's marketing hype. And I have one post that just uh, has links to some of the tech news stories that ex expose the hype. So they're trying to make it look like the average person is going to be so much better off and everyone's going to be so much better off with this latest generation of technology, but it's really all about the Internet of Things, and they're going to have to create a market for all these things and convince people that they need to have smart locks on their doors and smart television sets and smart uh, hearing, whatever they call those devices that people buy in their home, Google Home, that actually, in some of these devices, they don't tell you about, have, have microphones in them so they can actually turn them on and monitor you. There was a case of a smart garage door opener and the person got ticked off about it. So he posted on the, on a, on the website, on a website, uh, a review of the door opener. And the next thing he knows, uh, the manufacturer turned off his, his uh, door opener. He disabled it. And so he couldn't open his garage door. 
Uh, I mean, that's just a silly story, but the cyber surveillance thing, is, is a cyber security thing is a real big risk. Our government is currently uh, considering not allowing certain manufacturers in China to install infrastructure in this country, and there's a huge debate in, in the European Union about whether to allow these companies to uh, have their infrastructure used for uh, the cellular systems. Uh, And read that handwriting. Uh, I'm not a proponent of any harm reduction devices. I have a post on that. It's really a buyer beware situation. Uh, there's lots of devices if you go online playing with do, does this or that. Some of them may actually work. Uh, it's really a caveat emptor situation, buyer beware. And so I, I stay away from endorsing any, any products. Uh, and I try not to get involved in legislative proceedings. I see my role basically as translating and disseminating the research uh, with various audience, to various audiences, including uh, reporters, policymakers, the general public, wireless safety advocates, whoever basically wants to learn about this stuff. Uh, and that's what I've been doing mostly for the past 10 years uh, since publishing that review study. I did help coordinate a study, a six nation study, looking at exposures from cell towers the site that uh, I linked them up to was in LA because I had colleagues, a former colleague from here at UCLA and colleagues in the LA County Health Department were very interested in this issue. So we have some data finally from LA across a broad range of sites. Uh, the exposures were about 70 times higher than the last study that was done in LA, which was I think over 30 years ago uh, by the EPA when they were actually funded to do research on this. But one of the results of the EPA getting involved in the dispute over wh where to set the exposure guidelines, because they wanted higher guidelines than the FCC adopted, is they lost their funding to do research on this. So even though they had one of the preeminent researchers, Carl Blackman there, who stayed on, most of them left, uh, he wasn't allowed to do research on this. Uh, and his early research was showing evidence of genotoxicity, which the government did not want to hear. So I will conclude it at that. Uh, if any of you want to stay on and, and, and uh, talk to Adam, he may be interested in interviewing uh, several of you. I don't know how long he plans to stay. Thank you for coming.